Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the bell. Yo, be a father. If not, why bother, son? A boy can make him, but a man can raise one. Be a father to your child. Be a father to your child. So record your heart out, brother. That was it. That was the opening line. You did it. Right. Congratulations, D. Made it happen. <laughs> Made it happen, fellas. Hot start. Hot start. Yep. So do we uh, date ourselves and talk about voting? Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. It's yeah, good. I mean, let's just, you know, obviously this was recorded on the day of <laughs> the midterms elections. On Super Tuesday. Yeah. Is it, is, is it even Super Tuesday on the midterm? Nah, they don't call it that. Come on. Oh, really? <laughs> Damn, it's shit that, man. Yeah, my bad. I got people Fucking Dominic, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going on airplane mode. There you go. No more of that shit. Let me see. Let me make sure I'm not fucking up too. Man, do your kids ask about voting at all? It's funny. I was uh, I was just talking about. I was watching the CNN to see what the results were looking like, and obviously not much has happened yet. But uh, I called my daughter over because I was surprised. We had the TV on all day. They didn't have school, and we're analyzing, trying to understand what's happening. And none of them asked us any questions. And usually they're super inquisitive about things like that. So I pulled my daughter, my eldest. I'm like, yo, do you know what's happening? And she's like, I don't know, elections? And I'm like, yeah, do you know why this is important? I I was like, do you care? And she was like, nah, not really. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) So I was like, all right, bye. We'll talk about (laughs) that later. Yeah, whatever. We were all like that at at that age. Yeah. Especially the midterm elections. They're saying this is like the most, um, you know, attention midterms yeah. ever. Well, I mean, most important. I'm, I'm sure it depends on who you're talking to, but the most, uh, the most attention that a midterm has gotten in, in whatever modern history. Definitely feels like it. I mean, there's like uh, signs all over the place around our neighborhoods, and my son is walking around or driving around. He's what are, what are all these signs for? Why? You know, you know what I was thinking, man. Because I, you know, through my marketing company, we actually got hired a couple times by some of these political campaigns, and they pay really well. And they had us, you know, put up all these signs all over the place. And I was thinking, a lot of these candidates are like, um, you know, climate change warriors and and you know, green. But what the fuck happens to all those signs afterwards? I don't think these motherfuckers go around trying to recycle all that shit. <laughs> And that shit is littered everywhere. That that's something to ask one of the Green Party candidates. Like that's got. I mean, be. it doesn't have to be a Green Party candidate. I mean, any candidate that's, or, well, <laughs> we're giving each other hand signals uh, for people listening. <laughs> it sounds like we're getting awkward. <laughs> Yo, I'm so far from my microphone right now, and I'm saying who's far, who's close to the mic. Are no, you good? So, anyways, yeah. Anyways, that that's the, something I was thinking about because those shits are littered everywhere. And I remember when we did it, you know, because we did it like street team hip hop style, like fucking, we smashed the streets with those yeah, signs. Yeah. No remorse. <laughs> yeah. Yo, back I've then, been... back then, yeah, there was never a conversation about, yo, is is this right? Like, oh, should we be recycling? Oh, blah blah. Y'all just went and destroyed whatever walls and shit you could find, right? Walls, I mean, I'm talking about also um, the ones that go into the lawns. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. have metal, yeah. those metal things, and the actual sign. It's not a spike. It's like a like a frame that, that, that you know, both sides. And, yeah, and then it's those two sides spike into the into the grass. But I just imagine, like, a landfill full of these, you know, wasted candidates' dreams. You know, like, just litter, you know, all over the, this landfill. And yep. seagulls choking on whatever that... <laughs> material that those signs are made out of basically <laughs> the, the shit that comes to your mind bro <laughs> <laughs> but did, couldn't you picture that i could <laughs> i'm sure it's there and then just to bring it back what kind of world are we bringing up our children into <laughs> right well i noticed in my son's school they they're doing um all the elections for his school like what well, are they called? Stu- student council and all that stuff yeah. Cool. yeah that makes sense Today as well. Uh, I don't know if they're doing votes today, but all this, all these past couple weeks, there's signs all over the school for the student candidates for 
student council and all that stuff. So it was kind of strange how all this stuff was happening at his school, and then he's seeing all the signs around the neighborhoods for everything. And so right. No, that's cool. Had like, the hell is going on around here? That must be a special kind of kid at that age to be like, yeah, I'm gonna run for whatever the hell they're running for there. Yeah, I think they kind of put him into, you know, like, oh, you should run for this and kind of big it up to make. Yeah, it but there's so many idea. kids. Not everybody can. So you know, you have to. You know, there's only a handful of kids that can can get involved. So, I don't know. I just feel like that that is indicative of some kid that could potentially, in the long run, get into you know political science or whatever, <clears throat> or just be a dick. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Man, your did you, has your oldest done any of that kind of stuff at that school? Nah, nah. Uh, I mean, I, so now that you brought it up, I'm gonna ask her if they even do that at her school because. It's the first I've heard of it in like an elementary or middle school. I imagine in middle school they probably do, but not nothing that I know about in elementary school. Yeah, my son's school goes up to I think fifth or sixth grade, so I don't know. Uh, fifth. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that. Uh, I don't think the kindergartners or the first graders are doing it, but I think further up they're they're doing it. Right. And I wonder what their duties are though. In that age group, yeah, not, who nothing, knows? Nothing serious. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hall monitors and shit. Yeah. <laughs> or they're or they're counting uh, fake money for the treasury. <laughs> Foul. <laughs> <laughs> no, the kids got access to Bitcoin for yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, so what's, the, la- huh? what's uh, the latest and the greatest? Yeah, man. I was trying to think of like what what I had going, but nothing struck me. It'll come as we discuss, though. My my wife gets I, on my case. She's like, "There's so much shit that you don't talk about that <laughs> that you should be talking." That's about. what happens when you when there is a microphone in front of you. You lose, yeah. you know, all like you just your mind goes blank. Yeah, basically vocabulary, articulation, thought patterns, like because people, you know, that even for me, like after I be like, "Damn, I could have talked about this and that and." And you just forget it all, man. Microphone just fucks you up. We, we've actually had um, I had a interesting convo with my son yesterday. Um, my my wife and I had been talking about it, about uh, skin tone and skin complexion. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I don't know, Manny, if you, if your oldest is, uh, you know, what kind of talks you had about race or ethnicity or any of that kind of stuff, but it's it's um. It's one of those kind of convos that's starting to happen now, especially because, like, kids at school start talking about it. And, I mean, for him, he never really talked much about it. And generally in our circle of family and friends, you know, it's it's everyone, all different hues. And so that's just normal for him, just, you know, seeing all different shades. Um, but I noticed, uh, I noticed that, you know, he's had – a couple questions every now and then just kind of wondering, you know, like what his, what his skin tone is and what it means and, and all that stuff. So is it just skin color? Or does, does it go deeper? Like with ethnicity and cultural? Um, it's yeah, it's cultural and, and skin tone. Uh, we try to kind of get him off of the idea of, you know, focusing too much on skin tone or like describing people by skin tone because we mm. try to, we try to kind of lump it in with like, look, everyone's got different hair skin some people are tall some people are short you know what i mean there's all kinds of differences with people um and then there's the questions of you know when like we'll say you know you're you're from el salvador he goes but i was born in california (laughs) you know that kind of stuff so then it's like starting to have the conversation about um you know where your where your families come from and how that kind of makes up who you are uh from an I guess from a cultural level or an ethnic level, and right. um, yeah, it's just like I mean, for me, it's, you know, I I have to remember that he's six, and you know, there's just a certain amount of information that he's gonna take from it and care, you know, and so it's like I, I got to give it to him in stages instead of like going in on, you know, well, everyone originated from Africa, and then you know, this is why the this is why there's different right. shades, and you know, and. Race is a man-made construct, and you know all that kind of stuff. Like, I want to go mean, there. But... It's complicated even for us as adults because it yeah. actually is evolves still. It's still evolving, and then when you start a- adding the gender stuff to it, 
like imagine like like i mean but even just just racially and ethnically like i found i think it's gotten even more complicated and it's hard to even i think for adults to start wrapping their heads around it because it's just so many layers to it it is and even when we were when we were filling out his school stuff and then it starts like they had they had uh select your race select ethnicity so for ethnicity all they had was um hispanic slash latino and then it went to race and it said black white asian it didn't have anything else and so it was very strange just in terms like how do you like how do you categorize yourself and all this stuff i tend to let to categorize myself by what i think the cops categorize me right (laughs) whenever i used to hear them call like a white uh male latino i'm like i guess that's what i am (laughs) thank you officer you helped me with all this (laughs) you helped me with a lot of applications yo (laughs) everybody else is stressed out getting handcuffed and he's like oh Damn, that solves the problem for me. Thank you. <laughs> Straight up, I swear to God that that, that helped me fill out applications. Because I used to be like Hispanic, you know, they didn't know why. I'm like, I ain't white. Fuck that shit. You know, like, right. but then, uh, you know, then the color, oh, fuck it. If he's, I mean, it's kind of official at that point. Right. So. <laughs> That's funny, bro. We, we, he already called me in. They got me down. Oh, we, were some, we were somewhere at a, at a function and there was an older an older woman, like friend of the family, and and um, she this is a couple of years ago. And my son is in his fair skin, and she looks at him. She goes, "You know, he his, if you look at him, he's white, but he looks Hispanic. There's something about him that looks Hispanic." <laughs> you know, my Damn, wife and I were they're looking, in on. <laughs> my wife and I were looking at each other like. This is crazy, right? Here. Yo, <laughs> like, like mad in the open, it, talking to us, but just out of the blue. It was like, oh, oh. This, this is weird, <laughs> you know. You, you know what I think, and I've put, I've been thinking about this. I don't know a lot lately. I think that um, people like society needs to give a break to some people that come from certain generations. Yeah, because. They say things that sound outlandish to us. We yeah. might see things that sound outlandish to another generation, you know, because it's just it's just the way you grew up with certain things that, you know, just and, you know, you might get it and you might and you don't mean ill and, and you don't mean to be mean about something. It's just it's just stupid things that people say. Yeah, yeah, it definitely wasn't malicious. It was just a strange like what a strange conversation starter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> a hell of an icebreaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My you, should, you should hear the shit coming out of my grandma's mouth right now in the hospital um, about the different races and ethnicities taking care of her. And she's being nice, but it sounds crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, raise, you raise a good point, though. Like, the generational gaps and just what people have gone through in different generations. <clears throat> Yo, there's just a certain mindset. And it doesn't come from a bad place. And I have countless examples when you said that. A bunch of them just ran into my head. And I don't, I know not to take it any way other than, po- not positive, but like well intended because I know where they come from and who they are. But also, like, that's why, like, you know, an older person, you know, six, 70s, 80s maybe of age, I don't even pay much attention to what they say. I just smile and keep it pushing. Yeah. Right. They, usually, they're not really, not really thinking, hurt nobody with what they're saying. Nice. Unless you see a Confederate flag waving, then we got some other issues we got to talk about. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's it's confusing conversations to have with a with a kid because it's like, damn, what like what do you what are they gonna understand and what are they not gonna understand? For for, for my oldest daughter, um, the the whole color thing has come up a bunch. I think now she's a lot better um, with respect to her own complexion and like. There, there were some challenges for her because everybody around her, once we left Miami and we were in California, she started to see uh, less of her own. Got it. And more of a bunch. Of, and in California, I mean, there's still a lot of diversity, but she saw more. It's different in California. White I folks think. than she did in Miami, for instance. Right. And, um,. She would always come back home and be like, why do I look like this and that? And we would be like, yo, you're black. Like, I'm black, you're black, your mom's black, we're all black. 
and kind of just kept it real basic. But then she started comparing all of our skin tones. It was like, no, I'm sure if anybody's black, it's me. Because she's darker skin than we are. And then she started to feel a way about that. Cause, and it wasn't like people were speaking down to her because of it. Or she was feeling like the racial, um, you know, the racial feelings that most people Racial have. pressures or... Right. It wasn't any of that. But she noticed, like, something was weighing on her. And it was just comparing herself to others and her feeling like the outcast because of it. And then at some point, I can't even tell you when, but we just kept, you know, re- reissuing to her, like, oh, this is not a big deal. Like, your complexion is beautiful. Here's some. We had to show her other faces and other people that of her same complexion so she could start to understand, like, A, there's differences, but B, there's also a lot of beauty involved in having, you know, the, her complexion. And how did you. How did you bring in the the Cuban aspect? And uh, di- is her dad Cuban as well? Her her dad is Dominican. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but her mom was yeah her mom brought in the the Cuban aspect and again that was another conversation because the large extent of Cubans that she was that she encountered were fair skin, mm-hmm. so she would always associate lighter skin folks with Cubans. Cubans and Dominicans, right? More brown. More brown, right? And so. <laughs> My my wife was like, no, nah. my my wife's uh, grandfather was, I mean, practically an African American looking gentleman with blue eyes, and so she would bring out a picture of him, and she'd be like, yo, but this this is your your great grandfather, and she'd be like, oh snap, like she kind of there, there was a relationship established there that she kind of right. felt good about, so that that's kind of how we brought it all in, but it it was very it's it's a very difficult path to navigate. Because you don't, like you were saying earlier, okay, you can't really jump in and get too deep. But in my case, the emotional aspect is really front and center. So you kind of have to manage that in order not to have a, a cryathon. Right. It 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 seems um, it just seems like it's so complicated, and it's probably gotten even more complicated now. I'd imagine for kids in this new Trump era, you know, um. Just because it's just race is being thrown around a lot, and and Manny, just really quick, I actually want to ask you because growing up, you know, growing up around a lot of Dominicans, it seemed like Dominicans had a hard time dealing with their with their racial identity. At least all the Dominicans I knew, you know, it's like whether they were black or not black, or you know, they would always talk about the black person. And I'm like looking at them like, bro, you're black, you know, like. So did did you have that issue? Because hearing you say we're all black. Usually from a Dominican, yeah. I don't hear that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Obviously, I'm blumping all the people I know into the whole Dominican race, but you know <laughs> what I mean. No, nah, it, it's it's a. I mean, that, that's one of those deep rooted like issues I have with my people because of what you just said. Like, I mean, there's people that are. <laughs> I mean, the blackest person that you've ever encountered, the, that that type of complexion. Are, you have Dominicans that are just like that. Right. And they will look at a person that might be a couple shades lighter than them and l- call them black mm-hmm. and never associate themselves with, with being black. And so it, it's uh, there's like this huge historical baggage. Yeah, no, it's colonial. It's colonialism yeah. and... And it goes back to the slave trade and, and you know, the, the you know the whole stuff with the Spaniards and all yeah. that stuff. So, for sure, that's way co- co- more complicated but, than but it's, I mean, it's fatherhoods can go. <laughs> you, I mean, you hear, it, what's crazy is it doesn't change. Even with um, the, the U.S. Dominican, right? Born in the U.S., raised around all different types of people. In a lot of cases, raised with black folks, you know, from early on. Right. You still hear them talk like, nah. The black dude, like, you're not even in the same, you know, color pattern. You know what I'm saying? It's really strange. Well, but my I don't, son, I don't get down my, with it. My my son was uh, like last year. He was. We were in New York, and he was uh, playing with a little girl. She was about a year or two older than him, Dominican, um, and she had she had kind of like a, a dark brown complexion. And they were talking, and my son said, oh, you know, I have a friend at school. Uh, her name is Sia, and Sia is from India. She goes, oh, yeah, you know, and, and I really like her. She's nice. You know, just like chit-chat. And then the little girl looked at him and said, is she white or black? 
And then he goes, Whoa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he goes, what do you, what do you mean? He goes, what color, what color is her skin? And he goes, um, uh, your, your color, like mm. your, your, your skin tone. And she goes, oh, okay, well, you know, I, cause, cause, Cause I, you know, I don't like black people, but, um, what the but, fuck? you know, to, and my son was scratching his head. Like, like he you just like couldn't, yourself? like he couldn't, he couldn't wait the little the person, the, the little, little girl. girl. Yeah. She's Dominican. Right. So she, she's, oh, she's Dominican. Dominican. Oh, yeah, so you're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about, so she had, Dominican problem. so she's Dominican. Uh, she had, you know, uh, dark Brown complexion, my son. And then, you know, she asked about skin color, color, right, of, right, right. His friend friend is indian and skin tone was a little, was similar and but then the little girl kind of went off on like she doesn't like black people and it's, you know it's good that the little girl wasn't black my son was just kind of he didn't know what to <laughs> what the hell to say yeah. i thought that uh, you know it was and so it's going back to like when we're talking about older folks um it's like on one hand we can discount what they say but then on the other hand and no matter from what ethnicity if but if a lot of this stuff, the, the basura gets passed down from generation to generation, it's like, it's it's hard to, to to you know change people's yeah break that, right. break those cycles. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that imagine, I'm sure it gets better with each generation, but it's it's always a step behind, and it yeah. always you know some there's something like I'm telling you, I'm sure there's stuff. That I mean, I'm not gonna throw you guys in there, but I might say something that sounds culturally, ethnically, ethnically doesn't even work, <laughs> <laughs> ethnically um, insensitive. You know, just because you're used to joking a certain way with friends or whatever, it, that might have been, you know, something that was right in a certain time period. But then you're yeah. moving forward. You know, same thing with like saying, "Man, you're gay." Like we're used to saying that. Like, bro, you're gay. But obviously, you know, nowadays that's starting to be sensitive to people. Where you can't say those type of things, and but it's kind of hard to take it out of our vernacular because we grew up. That's like a part of us, like you know the gay jokes thing. But you know, we don't mean no ill. Like, like I don't have no problems or hate anybody's gay or that have any issue with that issue. But it's just something that we grew up with, and it's just hard to shake. Yeah, you know, just like like just like growing up in the hip hop generation and saying the word nigga. You know, what I'm saying like it's, you know, we know that it's. It, it's something sensitive, but it's, it's some, some something hard to shake sometimes when you grew up saying that word, but you didn't mean it in any kind of negative connotation. It's just a part of your vernacular. How did, how did you navigate, Manny, with the, so in terms of claiming blackness, and and was was that a something that inherently in you, or was that something that uh, your family passed on to you yeah, as opposed my, to my my family subscribes to the traditional Dominican type of, of thinking. Okay, the racist uh, thinking. I, that's what I call it. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I, I just, I got to a point where I felt, I felt like I wasn't Dominican when I would be in DR. Like I would go right. to DR and I wouldn't be considered Dominican. And then I'm here and I'm not considered American. So I was kind of in this limbo. And then I, I started analyzing like my customs, my, my way of being, what I liked, right. what I disliked. Right. And uh, it all boiled down to me, you know, very much a hip hop head. Uh, I was big into basketball, still am. And that was predominantly you know, the people I played with were, were black. And just a lot of the cultural things that, that black folks have, I subscribed to at a very early age. So I was like, not, not that I was dismissing my Dominican heritage. I'm very proud of that. But I was like, I'm more close, closely tied to all of the things that black people enjoy and, and happen to be and the struggle to me was the same right like and, and you know to ease earlier point like a police officer comes and looks at me yeah, yeah. i might get called a spick every now and again but generally it's nigga you know what i'm saying right. and so i was like yo all right <laughs> and and ancestor wise there's folks from africa who were brought to dr, DR and so haiti and Enough. Oh no no that yeah. that's de that's definitely the case. Yeah, you can't. So, yes, yeah, so you can't. No, for sure. It, this is the one thing. I, this is what I tell people is different about. I mean, I'm sure New York can 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 be a part of this, but South Florida is is the Caribbean, 
you saw that, 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 and that's where it gets complicated. I'm sure that for kids of all generations, they've had issues because I remember Haitian kids coming, they couldn't get along with black Americans, you know, yeah. African-Americans, uh, you know, Jamaicans, they, they didn't see themselves as, as, as African-Americans. And it was like this whole thing. And then Dominicans, like I told you, like I dated a Dominican girl and I was like, like scratching my head when her family saw me and they were like, Oh, your your kids are gonna have nice hair and i'm like what the fuck yeah. like you know like like they were just like i'm looking at them like why are you guys like why are you not proud of who you are what you are how you are like what why is this because someone might have straighter hair or lighter complexion gonna add to you you know because what it was is that the way that they saw things and this is the colonial mind frame is that they were lightening up their family yeah Improving their giving race. them better hair, giving them lighter skin, and that to me was insane. You know, especially a kid growing up in the hip hop generation. You know, I'm just like looking at these people, like, what the fuck is anti public enemy all the way? You know, like, like, <laughs> like, what are you guys talking about, man? And 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 yeah, and I learned that's the first time I learned about the Dominican state of mind in terms of that stuff. And I've met a lot of Dominicans here there that are kind of shared that that mind frame. And, and don't get me wrong, all Caribbean, I think, has. Shares the similar mind frame because they're all part of that colonialism, and even South America, Central America. Um, oh yeah, even, in, even like Central America, we find like when we moved out here. So my wife's family's from El Salvador, and and out here, um, you know, like Mexicans hate on Salvadorans yeah. and Guatemalans, and right. so you know, I, it's just I think it's hard to get away from people disliking each other <laughs> you know, and, and you know again bringing it back full circle like these are things now i'm starting to even think about more because my daughter is you know in a sense culturally diverse in the sense that my family is cuban um her family is guatemalan and native american right you know, i consider my baby to be brown in that sense and um, so, you know, these are things that she's going to have to tackle, like, you know, the native side, the, the Guatemalan side, and then the Guatemalan has its native part, too, and then the Cuban side. And, and then to kind of explain, you know, and then my family on my dad's side is European from Spain. So, you know, there's all these things. And then you got to kind of like try to present this to your child because you want them to have a good understanding of their identity and how it makes them better. And then to be able to appreciate other people's identities and races and ethnicities and all that stuff. Yeah, man, it's, it's 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 confusing to, you know, how do like how do you explain all that to kids, and then it's, and then because what we've essentially created in, in America is, is, is cultures as opposed to you know a race is just a construct for right all, all kinds of political stuff and money and all that business, but you know what we've essentially created is you know there's there's white culture there's black culture there's all these different cultures and and that's why there's folks of you know different shades and skin tones who are in these different cultures and they you know uh, assimilate with those cultures depending on how they're raised so it's well what we what we need to happen so that we don't have to deal with any of this is we need an alien invasion <laughs> right. and we're all just humans <laughs> you know and then we're good you know what I'm <laughs> That'll bring us together. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, older folks, and I'm going to segue this into our next guest, and he—he's not necessarily an older I, folk, I but he's. An, see, I want to see how this he, is going to go. But he's an OG. He's an OG. He's definitely so. an OG. Yeah, he's an OG. And it's and, funny. I mentioned Public Enemy, and he yep. had some part in that. So, so uh, let's big let's, part of that. Let's bring in Mr. Bill Adler here. Let's do it. So yeah, we got the great. Bill Adler, aka Ill Badler, with us. So a legend. Yeah. So I mean, damn man, there's a lot of things. Uh, I don't know. I could call you a hip hop historian. You know, you've been a PR guru, a filmmaker, label owner, gallery owner. I mean, you name it. So uh, a man ahead of his time. And and proud father. Well. And proud. Oh, father, and a proud yes. father. That's true. That's certainly true. Yeah. So all uh, much respect to, to Bill. So yeah, man, we're uh, you you are actually uh, you know a bit older than us, not too much, but you've got more uh, experience in the realm of fatherhood for sure. You got two 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 grown kids. That's true. And we're just learning right now. Yeah. So, so. well, let me not be shy. Also, let me <laughs> let me just inform everybody listening that I am now sixty six years old, and I will be sixty seven next month. So, oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Nice. 
the oldest man in hip hop. Actually, it's not quite true. I think uh, uh, Ernie Panicoli is older than me. <laughs> but you know, I'm older. I'm older than Cool Herc. So boom. Oh shit. Uh, um, let me just yeah. And my kids, I've got you know, my daughter Ruth is now 32, and my son Sam is 28. And the family dynamic growing up that you, it was it was you and your wife Sarah with with the two kids all, the whole time, correct? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you know, you forgive me because you know uh, this show, I guess, is newish. So maybe I have uh, an excuse for not knowing just you know exactly what you're up to. But you know, I, you know, of course, I'm happy to talk about fatherhood. But you know, it's it's a, a question in my mind. You know, how much emphasis you put on, uh, you know, a partner in this life. You know, a wife, a mother. Uh, because, you know, whatever, that's the way I've done it. And I think, truthfully, I think that's the ideal way to do it. I think a single parent has a hard way to go. Yeah, for sure. No, we, we definitely, uh, on this show, and you're right, it is newish, but we, we definitely try to focus on the father, but never discounting the mother. I mean, she's always a very critical piece of what we're able to do as fathers. Yeah, so I'd yeah. say it's it's more of a therapy session, uh, so we can kind of learn from each other, and since okay. we kind of don't know what the hell we're doing, but to we're be trying. better partners <laughs> to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I I must say, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm not a woman because you know it, it seems to me yeah, on the basis of my own pitiful experience, uh, you know, that it's a woman's job not just to take care of herself, but to kind of educate a guy and to civilize a guy. We're cavemen. I think basically, and and you know we're we're uh, you know if you want to go back to a time you know before civilization, and this is a you know kind of a broad generalization, but we're the hunter gatherers, and the women are the ones who you know tend the fire at home, and you know, it, it, typically we're okay going out into the wild and killing dinner, but as for the rest of it, making dinner, bringing up the young ones, most of we don't know about it. And it's, um, you know, it's up to a woman to, you know, take us by the hand as if we're the children and yeah. say, listen, it's a partnership and this is the role you should play so that I don't jump the fuck out a window, you know? <laughs> Amen. I agree. I mean, I'm just saying that's, that's been my experience, you know, and, and uh, so I just, just right at the start, you know, I'd like to give props to my wife <laughs> <laughs> for educating me and for putting up with me and for living a life with me. Smart man. It's been Smart incredible. Man. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't have done it without her. Hey B. So when you when you started in hip hop in the in the early '80s, so you were already a little bit older than some of your folks that you were working with, and and by that time you already had you already had Ruthie. Ruthie was born then when you were started no, at Def Jam. Ruthie, no, no, no. I was although I was older than everybody. So in 1984, when I started working with uh, Russell and everybody at Def Jam and Rush. I was already 32 years old, so that made me, you know, whatever, six years older than Russell, uh, roughly 10 years older than Rick Rubin. You know, uh, if I'm 32, when we first signed up LL Cool J, he was 16. Wow. You know, when, when uh, Will Smith, and uh, as the Fresh Prince, started working with us in 87, 88, he was 18. You know, Run DMC, uh, you know, uh, they, when I started working, they just put out their first album. Those guys were all 21 years old. So, yeah, I was older than every damn body. And I was married, which is really the crucial thing, because, you know, these guys were all younger. It's rock and roll. They go out every night. They're on the road all the damn time. Uh, everybody is single. Everybody's fucking around. And, you know, I was just going to go home at the end of the night because I had a wife, and I wasn't chasing pussy anymore, you know? And so that, that, that made a huge difference. And then, you know, we did not have kids, you know, right then, but then Ruthie was born on the 4th of July, 1986, which, ha which happened to be uh, the summer of raising hell. Oh, jeez. Uh, wow. Yeah, so that's, you know, uh, that, that's what I was working on that summer. You know, that's, <laughs> that's Run DMC and Houdini and LL, and at the bottom of the bill, it's the Beastie Boys. So, uh, and, and we're touring, uh, touring arenas from coast to coast. But um, yeah, so that's what it was like then. So how did how did being a, a new father <clears throat> impact the you know the, the the job situation or the life you were living with? In, in well, the you Def know, I, I, I really I I uh, performed the job in a really kind of a square fashion. You know, everybody was younger. Uh, you could say that everybody was more driven 
than I was. You know, somebody like Russell never stopped working. I mean, you know, he, he went out every night of his life and partied at the clubs, but also, in effect, he was working at the clubs. Right. You know, so he'd be up until, let's say he was up, uh, you know, uh, until 4 o'clock on a given morning. You know, he'd still pull his ass out of bed and start making phone calls by 10. He never stopped. And Lior Cohen was also pretty similar, and he wasn't married either. And, you know, I accept that both those guys are more driven uh, than I am. I was content to, you know, get to work at around 9 and leave at 6 or 7 and then, you know, go home and have dinner with my wife and get up the next morning and do it all over again. And that's really square, but uh, that's how I lived my life. So when Ruth and so, uh, oh, so, so anyway, wait, oh, so, so with that in mind, so when we had, you know, when, when Ruthie was born and then when Sam was born, you know, I... Uh, you know, I did. You know, I wasn't going to be babysitting for the kids during working hours, but I'd come home and then I would, I would be a partner with my wife and, and care for the children. And did the did did the folks you were working with did they respect the the idea that you had a family and you you were putting your family first on, on the priority I level? I suppose. Yeah, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, you know, the company was very very small, and everybody, you know, nothing really mattered except getting the job done. And, you know, um, you know, by the time Ruthie was born, I'd been working with Russ for a while, and, and, you know, people were excited that there was a new baby, you know, in the family, so to speak. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd take Ruthie, you know, into the office sometimes, and everybody would come and coo at her, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, and, you know, nobody gave, nobody gave me a hard time. And wh- when did they... When did they start to realize kind of the work you were doing? I mean, at what age do you think? And, and maybe they thought it was cool or they got a, some kind of inclination as to... Uh, gee, you know, I'm you trying to different. think. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think. So Sammy's born in 1990 uh, during the uh, presidential campaign of the year 2000. So I'm, I'm long gone from Rush by then, but I still had... You know, a lot of friends in the world of hip hop, and uh, I supported. Um, oh fuck! Who's the guy who ran as independent independent candidate in the year two thousand? Uh, white guy from Texas. Uh, uh, I know. Terrible. The Green. Well, Ra- it's not Ralph Nader. <laughs> yeah, Ralph. Yeah, Nader. Nader. Uh, yeah, okay. Ra- guys, Green, thank Green you so Party, much. right? Ra- I don't even know. He, I yeah. mean, I wasn't voting for a party. I was voting for him. Yeah. And, you know, he was, he was a, potent, uh, a potent candidate. And one of the things that I did is I reached out to some friends of mine uh, to produce these little on-air uh, thingamabobs where we took a Nader speech. You know, I, I got a, a recording of a Nader speech, and I, I gave it to, you know, several different folks I knew and asked them to cut it up and put it to music. And then I uh, sent it out to college radio stations as a way of, you know, bucking up support for Nader. And one of the, one of the folks that I sent it to was Adam Horvitz of the Beastie Boys. And you know, so he made this thing, and then he was over at the house. And I think, you know, my daughter and one of her girlfriends were just, you know, stunned. So Ruthie is like 14 at that time. Wait a minute, there's a Beastie Boy in the living room? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so That was the moment. Yeah, but I mean, you know, whatever. I've got photos of my daughter when she was, uh, shoot, she was barely two. And, uh, you know, I uh, I worked with Jeanette Beckman to put out a book of photography of her photos. And we had a big party at a, at a, at a bookstore. And, um, oh, Ed Lover was there and Grandmaster Flash was there and MC Search was there. And my daughter didn't know any of them at the time, but she, you know, she's a babe in arms, but there she is hanging out with these guys. So, you know, in effect, they grew up in the middle of it. That's cool. We were talking a little bit earlier about just starting to explain to our kids when, you know, about cultural and skin tone and race and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of just kind of tiptoeing through it and figuring out the ways to, to discuss. You had a pretty um, racially diverse circle of people you were working with. Um, right. How did when when did your kids start to to notice you know skin tone differences and how did you guys start to explain that and was it was it I don't a big know deal? Yeah. 
I don't know that we had to explain anything. From the time Ruthie was in nursery school, she had a preference for for black men, you know, <laughs> for black boyfriends. <laughs> so, you know, she she understood there was some kind of difference, and she was feeling it. You know, she was all in favor of it. That hasn't changed. Yo, that hasn't changed to this day. <laughs> Homegirl is 32 now. She's got a, a you know a black boyfriend right now. He lives in Harlem. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> oh, geez, the realist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's funny, man. You know, I had, I had, you know, actually, it's funny. I was telling, you know, my very first girlfriend, a woman I didn't marry. She's a college girlfriend. And I saw her for the first <laughs> time. She lives in L.A. She worked in the TV business. And I saw her for the first time in years and years in the year 2003. And by that time, Ruthie's preferences were very clear. And I saw, I said to my friend, I said, yeah, I said, you know, she seems to have a thing for black men. And, and th- this old friend of mine says to me, yeah, so does her father. And it's true. <laughs> you know? I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's not sexual, but, you know, I, I, I've always admired the hell out of you know the black community, and and uh, you know I ended up working with a number of, of uh, black artists, and and uh, you know it's not an accident. Yeah. That's dope. Boom. That's dope. What so here, what uh what about the the music industry? So, Bill, you've obviously had a storied career in the music industry. What is your take on? And I don't know what your your kids are involved in now, but if they're not involved in music. Has that ever been a conversation, and what's, what have been your thoughts about them entering that world? Um, well, you know, I, was, I never, you know, urged them to do, you know, any one thing or other. I mean, you know, my, my daughter, uh, you know, likes music. Her, her boyfriend, uh, you know, works in the music industry. Uh, my son, Sam, um, you know, has a day job as an elementary school teacher, but, you know, he is a, he's a rapper himself, and he's got a little crew, and they make recordings. And, um, you know, I, I, I encourage him. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, my basic advice about this is like pure, uh, you know, it's like the kind of speech you're going to hear at a graduation from any, you know, old fart. You know, I, I wish I could tell somebody something different, but the basic thing is you want to follow your heart. You know, if you get a strong pull in one direction and you're not hurting somebody, go there. And so certainly, you know, I'm somebody who spent my life, you know, it, it, uh, in, in my, it, I, I think of myself primarily as a music lover. And one way or another, I've been able to spend my life uh, involved with music and musicians. And I have no damn regrets about it, and my kids know that about me. And so, you know, they're they're pretty similar. I mean, are you are you guys saying yourselves that you know, you know for all of your involvement in the, rec- in, the in the music business, that you you uh, warn your own kids away from it? No, not necessarily. I, th- I think here we're all kind of just in the same vein as what you just described. Let let yeah. the passion lead the way. Yeah, it has to be passion driven. <clears throat> And and also let's not you know lose sight of this, which is you know it's heartbreaking. But not everybody you know feels a, you know a, a kind of a concentrated passion for you know any one thing. You know it's easy as hell to say follow your heart, but if your heart's not leading you in a particular direction, you know it's it's really really rough. You know I don't know how people <laughs> live truthfully. You know what gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, you know what do you love? You know if you ask most people what really, you know, thrills you in life? What do you love to do? You know, uh, I think maybe the majority of people, you know, would be taken by surprise. They've never asked themselves that question. And, you know, somehow they find out, they find a way to live, you know, anyway. But, you know, my idea is, you know, figure out something that, that um, uh, moves you and, and then devote yourself to that and you'll be happy in life. AB, how 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 involved are you guys still in the kind of guiding force and guiding just guiding your kids now that they're now that they're grown as opposed because you know it's like when we've got these young kids it's all hands on deck all the time and you know we're trying right. to move them around the best way we can uh, it, it, does that ever stop or do you still you know have your hand in in helping them navigate this this world well to the extent that they want my advice you know right. I'm I'm always ready to give it. 
Um, you know, I will say that I think they lean, and, and my daughter in particular leans a lot more on her mother than she does on me. Uh, but, you know, whatever, I'm going to remain their father, you know, until I'm in the dirt. And, you know, uh, they're going to be my kids, you know, as long as I'm around. And, um, you know, that that relationship doesn't – I mean, obviously the kids grow up. Uh, but, you know, if there's a bond of love there and communication and whatnot, you know, you, you're going to continue to talk. And, you know, the one thing that I'm always going to have that they don't have is greater experience just because I'm fucking older. Right. You know? So, you know, to the extent that I can help them anytime on any subject, you know, they know they can ask me, and then, and I'll try and help. Bill, and how did you... I'm sorry to cut you. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead, man. I have a, have no, a go burning, ahead, man. I have a burning question. Um, now that you have older children, um, yeah. I always fantasize about the day when my kids leave the home where I can yeah. frolic around my house butt-ass naked and not have a care in the world. Has that right. been something that you've been able to partake in? Well, <laughs> the, the butt naked part is not a part of my little fantasy. So, <laughs> yeah, man, he TMI, brother. <laughs> so, okay. not, not at all. I'm just saying, you know, you go. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I don't. I've never really felt, you know. Man, he wants to free ball. I, I, yeah, I've never. I've never felt, you know, too hemmed in by them. <laughs> You know, I've, I've just, I mean, it's really, I feel so blessed in my life that I've been able to do what I, I want to do, you know, professionally. And, and it's, you know, I, my, my wife gets me and allows me to pursue, you know, my creative passions. And so, you know, uh, it's it's not a problem. I mean, you know, right now, you know, yes, my son has moved out, so we have, you know, uh, more time it's it's a uh, it's an occasionally empty nest, mm-hmm. and so we have a little bit more freedom of movement and whatnot, and and we appreciate that. But you know, as I said, it's not like I felt tremendously hemmed in, you know, when the kids were younger. At least I, I don't remember it. I don't feel like well, you know, I can't do, uh, you know, I can't plunge into you know any given creative project at this moment because you know I got to wipe somebody's ass. That that didn't happen too often. <laughs> Nice. Well, what was your guys' um, kind of role and discipline um, with the kids? Like, what, I'll tell you this. Here's what I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. Uh, and this is crucial because I just happened to see it last night. You know, I, I watched the evening news, the NBC nightly news, and there was a piece about, you know, a study that had just come out about, you know, whether or not you should spank your children. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, saw, I saw that headline, yeah. And fellas, you know, it's 2018, I'm saying, really? And, you know, the, the, the punchline is, you know, uh, all the doctors and, and the specialists say, no, you should, not, uh, you should not spank your children. And, by the way, you shouldn't even yell at them. And, you know, I completely endorse it, and I'll tell you why. Because my father uh, used to strap me with a belt and... Um, you know, he didn't know any differently. You know, I'm guessing his father strapped him. And also, I was a fucking handful. You know, so I'm not making an excuse for him, but my father would beat me with tremendous regret. This is what he'd say to me. He said, Billy, you know, you beat a dog, and even a dog learns after a while. He says, oh, you, shit. you don't <laughs> learn. Wow. You don't learn. And so, you know, all right. Um, I did not like it, obviously, as it happened. And when I grew up and made children of my own, I resolved not to beat them. Big fuck. I mean, you know, it, it, it wasn't actually a revolutionary. It wasn't a big a revolution. You know, it wasn't a big struggle. But, you know, uh, tr- the, the bottom line is this. I don't think uh, physically punishing your children accomplishes what you want it to accomplish. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to discipline them. You want to change their behavior. You want, it to, you want them to change their thinking. Uh, I don't think you can beat them into that kind of change. I don't. You know, just, it's 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 really a, you know in a in a in a, uh, a more kind of macro level on the level of national politics. It's why so many people you know vomit, you know, when they consider Donald Trump because he's a bully. Mm. There's no persuasion in what he does. It's all about force, 
And I'm somebody who's always recoiled from that. And, you know, certainly at, a, at, at the level of, of you know, just uh, uh, a household, um, you know, just because you're bigger and more forceful uh, and you can impose your will, so to speak, on this smaller human being doesn't make it right and doesn't make it effective. Was, was Sarah on board with you? With, with that as well? Oh, you guys, of course. Yeah. Of yeah. course. I mean, you know, she, she's, a, I mean, uh, you know, or not, I was going to say she's a woman. You know, I think it's it's pretty rare for a woman to beat her child. Maybe I'm wrong. But, um, you know, also she comes from a, a nice, polite wasp background. <laughs> and uh, as far as I know, it, it's it's rare-ish for them to uh, resort to violence. So so what uh, was po- the what was the method of discipline? Um, you know, I, I, I talk as much as, you know, as much as possible and also as much as possible, keep my voice down. You know, I have, I'm, I still have a problem with that. You know, a part of it is I grew up in a family of loud Jews and, and, you know, at, you know, dinner table conversation was conducted at this tremendous volume. It's two adults and four mouthy kids and everybody speaking at once, right? So the idea that, you know, uh, uh, speaking loudly was inappropriate in any kind of way never occurred to me. And, you know, when my wife and I were still going together, and uh, it was early days, and we got into some kind of an argument, and I ended up yelling at her. All of a sudden, the entire thrust of the, the conversation changed, and she says, don't yell at me. She says, when you yell at me, you might as well hit me. <laughs> and, and I'm going, really? It was, it was all really almost funny to me. I mean, it was just it was such a far-fetched idea. Mm-hmm. I've been yelling my whole life. <laughs> and, my, and this woman I love says to me, don't do it. It's violent. And so, you know, I really spent, you know, the, you know my, my whole ad, adult life since then trying to restrain myself and, to, and, you know, to get my point across to my nearest and dearest without fucking yelling at them. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but the ideal is to uh, make your kids reasonable as soon as possible, and then just to talk to them about stuff. I mean, there are other ways to discipline a kid, uh, you know, short of, you know, hitting him. That's all I know. Hmm. You know, I guess you take away his toys or, you know, you know, don't allow him to do something that he wants to do. But, you know, I, I know what not to do, and that's, and that's you don't hit a kid. And it, it, when did you realize that, uh, or I'm, I'm assuming that it worked, that the, the reasoning was paying off with your kids and you were able to, kind of to talk things through any specific age that you remember for a, a breakthrough i don't know i mean the thing that occurs to me isn't really about disciplining a kid it's just <laughs> trying <laughs> not to bully my kid intellectually yeah. you know my daughter as as a 12 year old i think was a big fan of the television show sex in the city mm. and mm. uh i couldn't stand that it. it would drive me out of the room and you know it makes sense. It's it's for girls, and you know it's it's about women and it's for girls. Good, and you know so my my daughter sees me you know kind of leaving the room when that came on, and she said to me, Dad, what do you what what did what do you think of it? What do you think of this show? And I said, Ruthie, you don't want to know because I don't like it. She said, No, I want to know, and so. I said, listen, I don't like it, and here's why. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, before I you know, even took another breath. And she's 12 years old, and she just kind of listens, and she considers it. And, you know, she said, okay. But I, I hadn't managed to hurt her, which, of course, I, I didn't want to hurt her. I was afraid of hurting her. And, and um, you know, she just took it all in and then turned back to the set and finished watching, watching the show. So th- that's not really about disciplining her, but it's about uh, uh, her demonstrating the strength of her own mind. Because, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a forceful guy when it comes to my likes and dislikes. You know, before I did anything else in the music business, I was a critic. And so don't ask me what I think, because I'm going to tell you, including if I hate it, why I hate it. And, um, you know, I was very proud of Ruthie at the age of 12 being able to shrug, shrug off 
my intellectual <laughs> onslaught and just go back to watching what she wanted. So, I, fellas, I don't know if that's exactly what you know you were talking about, but that's what came to mind. Yeah, no, that's 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 what we're talking it's about. Totally relevant. Yep. Manny, because you got what your your daughter's eleven, right? She's eleven, yeah. She's and eleven. When, when he said "Sex in the City" and a twelve-year-old, I cringed. I was like, "Holy shit!" I don't even know if I have the the balls to not do some crazy shit so she doesn't watch that kind of stuff. But you know what? Let her watch it and then and then talk about it. It's like, you know, I don't know what it's like. You know, I, I think of the way that that rap music created a kind of a generational divide. You know, if you're a young person, you know, listening to rap you know, in the early 80s and mid-80s, and your parents hear it. You know, it didn't make any difference if, if, if your family was black, white, you know, some other color. You know, a lot of the parents would get upset, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and, and say it was terrible and attack it. And that's really, it's the corniest thing in the world. You know, it, it takes me back to the days, you know, you guys probably don't, don't know Ozzy and Harriet. Did you ever know the television show Ozzy and Harriet? Yeah. Did you ever hear of a guy named Ricky Nelson, uh, uh, like a post Elvis singer named Ricky Nelson? No, yep. this is way too old. No, right. I've heard. Let me just say, yep. I'm just saying the idea of, of you know there, that there has to be this kind of general generational warfare uh, over what kind of music a kid likes is very very corny to me, and so. Uh, you know, it's better to let a kid uh, dive into whatever he or she wants as long as, you know, it's not hurting anybody. Mm-hmm. And then if you've got some kind of, you know, whatever it is, moral objection, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic objection to it, talk about it. That's all. Damn it, Bill. Sorry. <laughs> You're right. You got to you gotta, you gotta talk to him. Did you censor it all? I mean, I'm assuming no, but did you censor it all, The any of the songs that they might have been trying to listen to, or did you have to sit down and explain you know, some of the lyrics to... I had to censor myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know there, there, there are some things, you know, I, 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 I guess I didn't want them to hear because the language was so, it was so rough. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's, as I think about it, you know, my daughter was, was very typical... You know, so, you know, she's going to grow up in, in, you know, our house, and basically I'm the DJ in the house, and I'm playing all kinds of music, including rap music. And so she, that was her environment. But even so, you know, the, her taste and the records that she liked, and the artists that she liked were, you know, the things that most of the other, you know, girls in her class liked. You know, she liked girlish pop. And I'm trying to think, what was it? There was an English trio of... Uh, uh, girl singers, and they were gigantic. Uh, Not the for a while. Spice Girls. The Spice Girls. She was nuts about the Spice Girls, you know. And what was I going to say? You know, am, am I going to give her a hard time because I wasn't feeling it? Yeah. Fuck me. It's not made for me. It's not made for me, and it's not hurting her. Right. So, you know, what the hell? What about Sammy? Because I know he was digging a little bit, right? He was just, um, you know, pretty early on, he became a, a huge fan of the Wu-Tang Clan. And he remains, uh, you know, a huge fan of the Wu. And he got into them and, and all the various individual artists much deeper than I ever did. And, you know, also for that matter, he's tried to turn me on to all kinds of things that have come along since I was paying an awful lot of attention. And, um, you know, I always want to listen. I don't always, you know, love what he has for me, but I always want to hear what he has to play for me. I mean, and, and, and actually it's, it's kind of wonderful that, you know, there's, a, a, in effect, a kind of a conversation that goes on like that, where I'll turn them on to things I'm listening to, and they'll turn around and they'll play, th- play things for me, and that goes on to the, to the current day. That's dope. That's a hell of a yeah, man. exercise. How do you think you call, how do you think someone cult could cultivate or would cultivate that because there's some parents that I see that just have a strong they all the, for whatever reason the the connection and the bond just seems there all the time and even if they're not a hundred percent in sync there's still commonalities and then there's folks that they just seem like you know the kids want nothing to do with the with the parents at all and I don't know if that's just I don't know I don't know what the to people. say you know listen I, I I will say this and this and I'm not happy to say this. 
But I think that some fairly significant of, of, uh, percentage of people who reproduce should not have reproduced. <laughs> and it's, it's really, it's, it's sad as hell for everybody involved, but particularly for the kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. to to uh, to be the child of of parents who don't care, who literally don't care. You know, I've got um, Sarah's got a cousin married to a guy. Uh, he's from Cleveland. It's, it so happens, but he teaches in New Hampshire. And I think he teaches seventh grade science or something in the public schools, and he's done it for twenty five years. So we're talking about the kids one time, and then I asked him about the parents because he sees all the parents in parent teacher conferences, and I said, "Listen, Rick." What percentage of the parents that you speak to never should have had children? And he came back right away. He said, 30%. He had been pondering that one. Wow. And that's, that's huge. And, I, you know, I, truthfully, I can't imagine anything sadder than a kid growing up without the love of his parents. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's so many kids who don't have two. And, and also, by the way, you know, I think it's ideal. If I said this earlier, forgive me, but, you know, I think the ideal is for uh, children to grow up with two parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, how many kids grow up with two parents and, you know, neither of the parents are really, you know, connected and devoted to raising a child. It's, it's really rough. Damn. Yeah. That's the, that's the drop the mic moment right there. Yep. God damn it, Bill. I'm sorry. You know, it, 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 <laughs> it's a, it's a, guys. It, you know, it's it's upsetting to me. You know, you know we you know so my wife and I have two kids, and uh, <clears throat> then you know Ruthie starts going to kindergarten, and so now really for the first time, you know, you know she had her little friends, very small group of friends at nursery school and whatnot. Okay. But then, you know, when, when, when she starts going to kindergarten and all of a sudden there are, you know, 25 kids in a class. So now I'm meeting the parents of 25 different kids. And I was appalled. You know, some of these parents were just manifestly <laughs> unfit. Mm. You know? What, what gave and, it away, though? What was, like, the, the calling card for, for that reaction? Oh, I don't know. They didn't know how to talk to the kids. Oh, they were okay. rough with the kids. Um, you know, they ignored the kids and, and, you know, mind you, this is, you know, you know, 25 years ago before there were, uh, you know, all these handheld devices and iPhones and whatnot. Good God. You know, that's, uh, you know, everybody talks about the effect, you know, the social effect of that stuff just amongst adults and the kind of impossibility of talking to, you know, a millennial face to face because the motherfucker can't take his eyes off his iPhone, right? <laughs> right. But you know what but what but what I what I believe also is probably true and I'm just guessing here, is that young hey. parents have a hard time taking their eyes off their eye their iPhone and paying attention to their kids. So it's yeah. gonna make a bad situation even worse. Yeah. I'm sorry guys. That, that's was, a problem. This, was it was this supposed to be a cheerier conversation? <laughs> no, no a real one. It's a real conversation. This is, a, this is exactly oh, right. what we, I mean. We're, we're trying right. to get nuggets here. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. All right. right in line. You know, I remember, you know, thinking about doing this. I remember uh, I was maybe 18 years old. It was my, my first job. I'm in, in, in Ann Arbor working at a record store. And there's a guy who was working with the Xerox machines. You're making copies. And he was a damn hippie, working class background, white kid. And he made his girlfriend pregnant, and they had a child. And I asked him about it, and he was serious as a heart attack. He says, you know what? You just, uh, you, w there's nothing for us to do but start paying attention. We have to care for this child. Hmm. And, you know, it stayed with me now. That's, that's whatever, almost 40 years ago for me, more than 40 years ago. And, and I was so impressed by his seriousness. You know, you brought another human being into the world. God damn it. Pay attention. Right. Take care. Kind of basic to me. It is. It is, it is basic, and it's kind of it's a head-scratcher why there's so many people who don't get that. Or they, people or, are thoughtless. You know why? Because yeah. fucking is easy. You yeah. know? It's really easy. And, and, and if, you're, if you're not careful, it's easy by mistake to make a baby you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do? I mean, a lot of people, you know, sure enough, you know, they'll get an abortion at that point. 
But that's sad even. You know, can't you be, you know, exercise a little bit of caution? You know, there's enough technology available to every human being on the planet just about. You know, certainly here in America, if you want to make a baby, you can make a baby, okay? If you don't, you can prevent it. Mm -hmm. Be a little thoughtful about this shit. It's true. Or they'll have babies with people they didn't want to have babies with, and then they'll take it out on the baby. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a problem. Right. That's a problem. You make you make the baby feel like it's their fault for being being around. Right. right. And then, you know, the, the, the kid will be talking to a shrink about it 40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's how you keep them gainfully employed. Sure. <laughs> Shrinks? Shrinks, yeah. yeah. Bill, question for you. So, with Ruthie, yeah, uh, and, and so I'm speaking because I have an 11 year old, and the hormonal changes are approaching, and I yeah. am scared to death. How did you? Don't be. Are you married? I am married. Three children. Okay, so your wife, your wife is going to pay mo most of the attention to that, and believe me, your daughter is going to look to your wife, not to you. So, were you? I mean, just so what do you? What do you? What do you? Tell me what? Tell me this, please. Forgive me. Oh. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Honestly, my biggest fear is finding a th th blood somewhere that it shouldn't be that's visible to me. That's my biggest fear. What, nature, dude? You mean yes. lo losing her virginity? or are you no, talking go, no, 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 whoa, no. Whoa, 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 okay, you sped. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know. You got a ticket, no, pull them over. No, that's... You're talking about hormonal change, though. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the period. That's okay, what I'm got talking it. about. Finding a well, pad somewhere that is is exposed that i can see that's my biggest fear but that's just that's but just... you know what i mean but that you know so that just speaks to your uh you know your squeamishness about this stuff i mean yeah. it really feels it feels to me like you know that's more your problem than hers <laughs> you know nature is going to make her bleed every month like this yeah. it's no picnic for her believe right. me so you know, uh, uh, it's something she's going to go through, and her mother's going to hold her hand, and you know she'll she'll get used to dealing with it. But if she gets sloppy sometimes, and somehow, you know, uh, you know you you see evidence of this you know change in her life, you know I want to believe you can shrug it off. I she think, probably I think she, I can. she probably won't even want to come to you about any of this. I would think, right? I mean, so that's that's my conflict. Like, I don't want to be the guy that's like, if she does happen to come to me like push her away I, I don't think i would do that but I, well you know guess what you know have this conversation with your wife let her know you're worried about this <laughs> no my wife and here's like, what she's gonna my wife is saying exactly what you said would occur she's like no i'll handle it and i'm like but, yeah but sometimes it's not about the parents it's the kid wherever they end up going to that man you just man up yeah okay, fine. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, it's I'm nature gonna, bro i'm gonna put that down in my fucking diary like i mean but, i understand no, but you know what, though, truthfully, this is what I think. If, you know, she were to leave a pad somewhere, a bloody pad somewhere, and you saw it, God. and, you know, you're not going to be happy. But guess what? If and when you turned around and you told her you found the bloody pad, she'd be completely mortified. She'd feel much worse than you. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying I should tell her if I ever... <laughs> no, I'm saying, you know what, in, the, in that case... You know, I mean, whatever. You can dispose of it. Right. Try that. If not, talk to your wife. Let her handle it. Yeah. Don't involve. Don't make the kid feel worse than she would feel anyway. <clears throat> yeah, that's got to be tough on the kids. Just nah. To... Yeah, I would. I wouldn't do that. That's just got to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thank you. I, I mean, <laughs> you what you're telling me was kind of the direction I was heading, generally speaking. So I, I just want to hear it from somebody who's had the experience. How they kind of let me well, let me let me all right, but let me let me ask you this. You didn't have any sisters, did you? No, I did not. Right. So yeah, I mean listen. <laughs> <All right. laughs> women are you know, women are different. And you know, again, you know, it's it's uh, it's their uh tough job <laughs> to educate us <laughs> about what it means to be a woman. You know, and just as, and you know, not to say that you know that we have to repress you know our our masculine traits. You know there, there's a reason that you know the the, the two sexes are uh, attracted to each other. You know, vive la différence, as the French say. You know, there's something a woman likes about a man. There's something a man likes about a woman. 
Yeah. But you know, having said that, it you know, it, it people dig the difference, you know, and 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 women are different than men, and so, um, you know, let a woman exp- explain the difference to you, <laughs> and accept it. You're married to her. You've got a daughter now. Yeah, I ain't got no other choice. That's <laughs> that's what I signed up right. for. Yeah. You're gonna and, see it. And, bloody path. and it's just it's just it's just nature. There's nothing wanton about this. There's nothing willed about it. It's just what happens. Nah, I know. Ugh. Man, Manny. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You need to get over that one, man. <laughs> it's got me yeah, feeling man. away. <laughs> It'd be all right, man. <sighs> well, guys, I, I have to jet. Actually, I have to take my daughter to basketball practice now. Oh, I got plopped with my daughter in the middle of the show. That's why I've been quiet. I've been trying to control her a little bit. <laughs> She's... She wants to talk to the microphone. Say something, Emmy. No, not yet. Will it be any, out. any? Uh, Wait, any... you're saying she does want to talk on the mic? Well, she's she's a uh, she's about to be six months, so she's just making you know little noises nowadays. But she yeah, she keeps reaching for the mic and the headphones. Well, you know, it sounds time. like it sounds like she's her, her father's daughter. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does have like uh, we have a playset that's almost like a little music station looks like a little dj thing and she loves that thing oh beautiful that's great very any, exciting you got any last words of wisdom for everyone b me yeah man come on drop some gems. just you know i want i want to salute you know what i just i do want to salute you guys for having come up with this idea i think it's a great oh, idea thank you no seriously it's it's it, it's kind of brave of you you know it's not like uh we're taught to talk about this stuff very much and uh you know i i think that uh you know too many younger guys uh just aren't built or they believe they're not built for marriage and then for fatherhood and uh so for you guys to to face it squarely and to discuss it and to get into the nitty gritty like this is is fantastic and i wish you all the luck with it and i and i really hope you know, for the sake of the general public, that you generate a huge audience. I appreciate that, Bill. Your words, appreciate your you, Bill. Yeah. Coming from you, that's huge. You'll, you'll, you'll join us again, B? Yeah, sure. But I'm telling you guys, also, you know, particularly in the world of hip hop, you know, uh, you don't you don't hear certainly not from the, not from guys. You know, how many rap songs can any of us you know think of that are like you know that are love songs that celebrate a marriage? You know, uh, not not very many, mm-hmm. and maybe it's because it's mostly a young man's medium. But with that said, you know, let let somebody who grows up, uh, you know, as a rapper, write some adult rap. You know, I remember having this conversation conversation with Chuck D. You know, thirty years ago, I t- I, I told him I said, you know what, I'm I'm sick of talking about a b boy. Show me a b man, would you? <laughs> mm. and, and, oh, oh. and 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 you know, we, there still could be. You know, a lot more music made under that banner. And, you know, until it happens, okay, boom. So it's going to take the form of this podcast, and I salute you guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks, B. Appreciate you, B. All right, fellas. Call back any time. Yep, indeed. All right. Out. Take it easy. Later. Yep. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the bell.